All right, now we are live. Thank you, everybody, for coming out uh, for our, I think it's the, uh, well, yeah, obviously, it's the first meeting of February. I don't know which, how many numbers we've met, but uh, tonight's topic by Super Testnet is Bitcoin privacy, um, specifically five uh, actionable tools to use and uh, keep your transactions uh, as private and your information as close to your chest as you can. So, uh, Super, feel free to take it away. Yeah, thank you for having me out here and um, always happy to do presentations for uh, the Toledo Bitcoin meetup. So uh, this one is about Bitcoin privacy and let's uh, let's jump right into it. Um, why, privacy, why Bitcoin privacy matters? Privacy in general matters for a lot of reasons, but uh, in Bitcoin, it takes on a lot of financial um, aspects. So one major point is that your income and expenses are nobody's business, right? Uh, this is what people... When I when I talk about privacy in in my daily life, people say, "What you know? Why do you care so much? Do you have something to hide?" And I'm like, oh, "Not, not particularly, but it's just not. It's nobody's business. What I, uh, how much I make, or, or what ex what expenses I I have. Um, that's that's valuable information, and uh, it, uh, no one really needs to know that except me and anyone to whom I choose to reveal it. Um, for many businesses, their expenses are a trade secret. For example, if uh, one large company is going to go buy another large company that can have an effect on their stock prices, right? So they don't they don't want to have that information be exposed. And if we, as we move into more businesses using Bitcoin, they're going to want tools that allow them to conceal expenses that you can't like easily just track. Oh, this this expense came from you know McDonald's's wallet. Looks like they're buying up you know this that or the other thing or you know something like that. Uh, that that can that can affect stock prices and. Uh, it affect uh, businesses' value, so they, they do want uh, tools for keeping their expenses a secret, their income as well. They, uh, co companies do have disclosure laws where they have to disclose certain things about their income, but they don't like to give that stuff away before it's time. Because um, then uh, when you are able to present your own earnings calls and stuff, you can control that narrative better than if anyone can just watch your, watch your income as it, as it happens. Publishing your financial info can also endanger you and others. I think of, you know, let's suppose that I go, let's, let's suppose one day I'm a multi-billionaire and I go and purchase a stick of gum from the local grocery store because that's what multi-billionaires do. I go to the grocery store and purchase gum. Um, but let's say I did that and then the guy who receives that transaction sees my address and he sees, wow, this address has, you know, 15 Bitcoins in it or whatever. So whatever a billion dollars is worth at that point. It's like, okay, I'm going to follow this guy home. You know, that can really endanger you. It can endanger your family. Um, so trying to not disclose to others as much as you can um, is great because it pre prevents such things from happening. Um, another, another concern is uh, it's dirty coins. If you receive your dirty, dirty coins you, uh, from someone and that person doesn't take any privacy measures and you don't take any privacy measures when you're receiving coins, um, you might get a knock at your door from the FBI who says, hey, this, uh, whoever just sent you that money got it from illegal gambling or drug sales or whatever. And you know, we want you to give as much information as you can about him. And may maybe you're an accomplice. You know, and then you get investigated for that. When you didn't do anything wrong, you're just you know, sold a PDF to somebody or a song you wrote or something. Um, so you, 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 there are steps you can take to avoid these things happening. Privacy steps, and that's what today's presentation is about. Uh, what Bitcoin data can be kept secret? Because uh, not everything can be. It is an open ledger. Uh, the blockchain is there for all to see, as we were looking at earlier and, and checking out other people's transactions. But here are some of the things you can keep secret. You can keep secret which addresses on the blockchain belong to you. You can keep secret some transaction data. When you're sending a transaction, you can keep secret um, where the where the uh, address or where the money is be, is coming from, what addresses it's coming from. You can conceal what addresses you're sending money to and the amounts you're sending. Uh, you can conceal your physical location. Uh, you don't want to leak your IP address uh, when you're sending a transaction because if you do, that IP address is tied to your identity as well as your location. And, uh, and that, that can be leaked by just spending, by just using a standard wallet. Uh, where you've got your Bitcoins from uh, can be leaked. Like if someone sees what address you sent from and you didn't take any steps to hide that, they can trace that back uh, and say, oh, the, 
he sent these coins to me from this address, but the, the prior address that sent him co coins belongs to Kraken or belongs to Gemini or whatever. And they can figure out that's where you're buying your Bitcoins from, um, which isn't, which isn't good. That'd be better if they didn't, that's none of their business, you know? So privacy in Bitcoin is optional. All of those things that are listed on this slide can be kept hidden, but they're not, using a, just a standard wallet. They're not hidden. That stuff gets leaked. Um, but it takes effort to conceal this information. You have to seek out privacy tools and privacy wallets in order to not leak your data. Um, and that's, uh, so that's what this is about. I'm gonna share some of those tools with you. Here are five privacy tools to mitigate the, to, to hide the things that I just said you can hide. First of all, a self-hosted Bitcoin node, we're gonna get into, we're gonna get into what all these terms are, but uh, just know what, what uh, as I get into what they are, I want you to know what they're for and in terms of privacy. Um, a self-hosted Bitcoin node is good for your privacy because w if you use that, then you're not leaking your addresses all over the place. And I'll tell you why in just a couple in the, in the next slide. A coin join is great because it hides from and to addresses and transactions. Pay join is great because it hides transaction amounts. If you use Tor uh, to connect to your Bitcoin node, then you're not leaking your physical location or your identity um, because you're not you're not disclosing your IP address. And then if you use BISC to buy your coins or another peer-to-peer -peer exchange, then you're not leaking where you got your Bitcoins from. And so these are all great tools you can use, um, especially in combination with one another, they really help. But I'll, I'll get into how they, a little bit more about what they do um, in the coming slides. So let's get into that. This is a picture of a Bitcoin node. This one is called a Noddle Dojo. Um, and they're available on the website of Noddle, I uh, actually did, I didn't put down in my notes where the web where you can buy these things, but this is one example of one of the ones you can buy. Max, if you want to go and get the website for Noddles and put that way, in the chat, that'd be uh, great. Way ahead of you, it's in the chat right there. Yeah, um, this is one example. I'm not saying I'm not saying go out and buy a Noddle Dojo, you know, but um, there are many different pa node packages you can get. You can even Bitcoin is free software. You can just download it, download a a program called Bitcoin Core on your laptop or your computer and run it without paying for anything. But um, just want to show, I want to explain what, what the benefits are of using a self-hosted Bitcoin node and what a Bitcoin node is. Uh, Bitcoin nodes are computer programs that form the backbone of the Bitcoin network. Um, that, that might be confusing why, why I said it's a computer program when I showed you a, a red box. A red box is not a computer program. Uh, this is a computer, though, right? And it's got programs running on it, and one of the programs on it is Bitcoin Core, in this particular device. So um, Bitcoin Core is a program that forms the backbone of the, of the Bitcoin network. Bitcoin nodes each download an independent copy of the blockchain, and then they verify all transactions that are sent uh, on the network, and they reject counterfeit coins. Um, contrary to... Um, expectation in this space that it is possible to create counterfeit coins in Bitcoin. Uh, and it's possible to send them to other people's wallets, which which can then get fooled into thinking that they've received Bitcoins when they really have not. A way to mitigate that is to use a self-hosted Bitcoin node, which verifies all the rules of the network. And when it receives a coin, it checks to see that it wasn't created out of thin air and it legitimately came from a, from a, that it was legitimately mined so at some point in a Bitcoin block in the past, and then sent to you from somebody who controlled the private key to that to that coin. And that's what Bitcoin nodes are good for, is they, they prevent you from getting uh, counterfeit coins. They'll reject them and say, hey, this, this coin's not real, which is great. Um, so that's uh, one great thing that Bitcoin nodes do. Uh, also, when you use a Bitcoin wallet, uh, it always, uh, every Bitcoin wallet connects to a Bitcoin node to get information about the blockchain. Uh, yes, the blockchain is public information, um, but that doesn't mean that your phone has it on, like if you're using a phone wallet, that doesn't mean your phone has the blockchain on your phone. It's a, big, it's a really big set of files, like 200, 200 300 gigabytes, uh, not gonna fit on most phones. So instead it, it connects to someone else's computer and says, hey, what's on the blockchain? And if you're connecting to someone else's computer, uh, in order to ask them for information about the blockchain, typically what your wallet's going to do is it's going to say, hey, these are my addresses. Can you tell me if there's any money in those addresses? And that's not good for your privacy because who knows if that person's keeping logs, you know, if, they, if they, every time you send a request saying, hey, here's a list of 15 addresses, 
Is there any money in those? Maybe they're keeping a log of that and saying, okay, the person with this IP address has these addresses. There we go. Now I know that. You know, that's valuable information. Um, so instead, what you can do is you can uh, you can set a Bitcoin wallet not to use someone else's node, um, but to connect to your own Bitcoin node. Uh, and that's great for your privacy because of the information on this slide. Remember, if you connect your Bitcoin wallet to someone else's node, like a standard Bitcoin wallet does, your wallet will tell that person all of your addresses. But if you connect your Bitcoin wallet to your own node, your wallet will only tell your node all of your addresses. And then your node will check its own copy of the blockchain to see if your addresses contain any money. That's great for your privacy because then you're only effectively telling your addresses to yourself and, uh, and not to anybody else. You're, you're keeping yourself from disclosing all of your addresses when you just use a, a, a when you use your Bitcoin wallet. Um, so I definitely recommend that you look into getting a Bitcoin node. We will have we have regular meetups about um, how to how to obtain one, what what software to download, um, or what you know what software we recommend, what hardware there is for running it if you want to have a dedicated device for that. Um, but all of that helps your privacy and. That's the most important thing for your privacy is to run your own Bitcoin nodes so you're not sharing your addresses around. Um, because the, someone who has your addresses, they know how much Bitcoin you have. They, they know how much Bitcoin you have. They know how much Bitcoin you're spending, how much you have available to spend. If, if you're someone who has a lot of your net worth in Bitcoin, they can tell your net worth based on that. Um, so it's all the information that you I personally don't like to share with other people, and so I, I like to use my own Bitcoin node for, for the things that I do. The next tool I want to talk about is CoinJoin. A CoinJoin is a type of privacy-enhanced uh, Bitcoin transaction, and this graph that, or not graph, this picture that I show at the bottom is taken from a another presentation I did um, last year uh, about CoinJoins and uh, various wallets that have uh, coin joining built into them. Um, but let me show you what's going on here. Let me explain what's going on in this picture. So there's a sender side and a receiver side. And the three guys on the, on the left-hand side of your screen are the senders. They're sending Bitcoins to, um, address, to Bitcoin addresses. And on the right, typically in the coin join, um, the, the people who are part of the coin join create, create these fresh new addresses that have never been seen before. Um, and this is how, this is, uh, by going through this process, one of the effects is let's say you bought coins on an exchange like Kraken, Gemini, Coinbase, or wherever. If you don't want Kraken, Coinbase, Gemini, or wherever to know what addresses uh, you have sent your coins to, you can send them through a coin join. And then you generate a new address that the bank has never seen before. And a coin join prevents them from actually seeing uh, where your coins ended up. Uh, and let me so let me show you how you do that. The three people all uh, take an equal amount of Bitcoins. In this example, they're each taking one Bitcoin and they're all putting it in one large transaction. That's what's represented by the by the box there. They all uh, co-sign that transaction, shake up the box, and then uh, the, co the coins come out um, and go to these fresh new addresses that the exchange has never seen before. And what does that do for you? Well, what that means is if, if you're doing a coin join to three people, and Coinbase knows uh, your, the, the address you're starting out with on the left-hand side, because that, that's the address you withdrew your coins to originally from Coinbase. Then once you put them in the box and it goes to the other side, they don't know which of those addresses is yours. All they know is uh, one of these addresses belongs to our customer, but we don't know which one. So it, uh, it effectively blocks someone like uh, Coinbase, Gemini, or, or Kraken from seeing through a coin join, they, they can't see to the other side of it where your coins are. All they know is it's in one of those addresses, but you know, could be in one of three, could be in one of 50 addresses, could be in one of 100, however many people are part of your coin join. Um, it's called an anonymity set. Uh, and it's, it gives you a, a, a degree of privacy that protects you from your exchange knowing where your coins are. It also protects on the other side. Let's say that after you do a coin join, you go to Walmart and, and spend those coins on a stick of gum. Uh, the guy at Walmart who wants to find out how much money you have, you know, he all he knows is that one address, right? And so if he if he tries to trace that back, and there's a coin join involved, he can't see through to the other side of that coin join. He can only see, well, he can, he can see I, I received coins from this guy, but 
there's a coin join in the middle of this transaction history. And on the other side of that coin join, he, the, the coins could have come from any one of 50 different addresses who were part of that coin join. And I don't know which one it was. So once you get, once someone who's trying to transact, uh, track the transaction on the other side, uh, on the receiving side, once they hit a coin join, they can't see through to the other side of it and find out where your coins came from. So a coin join helps you, um, helps you by preventing people who are tracking from, from the origin, see where the destination was. And it helps people, helps you prevent people who are tracking from the destination side uh, to see where the origin of those coins was. And that's really great for your privacy. Um, CoinJoin is in fact the, the, uh, among the best tools that we have available in order to protect the privacy of your Bitcoin transactions. One thing it does not do is hide the amounts. A standard coin join in a standard coin join, every participant puts the same amount into this uh, into this transaction box and then shakes it up. And consequently, uh, when that when that those funds come out the other side, uh, it's still you know if you put in one bitcoin and you get out one bitcoin, you haven't concealed that you have one bitcoin. You know, so that's one um, one thing that coin joins do not protect is someone who tracks tries to track your coins through them. Um, they may not know which address is yours, but they do know how much how much money you put into that address, and that's not ideal. But that's what the next thing is for, right? Pay joins help you help you hide the transaction amount. A pay join is a type of it's a type of coin join that is done by only two people instead of like 10, 15, or up to 100 that you can get in a regular coin join. In a pay join, you're only doing this with the with the recipient of your funds. It's a it's a form of payment. A pay join hides the payment amount. It looks like one amount was sent, but it was really another. A pay join does not use equal amounts like other coin joins. And this part's great. It looks identical to a regular Bitcoin transaction. Uh, and that's what the next slide is about. A, a Bitcoin transaction has a certain look to it. Um, here is an example pay join transaction. This, this long string of random, seemingly random numbers and letters up here. Um, is the identifier for a transaction on the blockchain that looks like this. And this uh, gobbledygook that I'm about to explain is uh, looks like a regular Bitcoin transaction. So let's, let's take a look and dive into this thing. On the left-hand side here, you see four Bitcoin addresses. And this, these belong to the sender. The sender of the payment uh, puts, uh, takes a number of addresses uh, and then creates a, creates a transaction with them. Um, however many he wants from his wallet, addresses that he has in his wallet. Each of those addresses then has an amount right here. And he's going to use these amounts to send, um, send some money to the recipient who is on this side. And uh, in this case, the recipient, 3PQ, is going to receive 0.08 blah, Bitcoins. So the sender, of course, he doesn't have he doesn't happen to have 0.08 already in just one of his addresses. So he has to use multiple addresses in order to add up the amount he wants to in order to add up the amount he wants to spend. And that's what he's doing here. He's taking four of the addresses from his wallet. He's adding those up to the amount he wants, which is 0.08. Uh, and then he sends that to this guy. But there is some left over when he adds up all of these. There's 0.419666 bitcoins left over as well as a, a fee that went to the miners. And so this, this amount then here comes back to him as change. And that's what a regular Bitcoin transaction looks like. And uh, anyone who is doing blockchain analysis, uh, like, our, like our friend who sold us a stick of gum at Walmart, would look at this and say, okay, um, here's the sender. He's got, we know he has at least this amount of Bitcoins and the recipient of this transaction received, uh, received this amount. Now, that's what a standard Bitcoin transaction looks like, but uh, in a pay join looks like that, but in a pay join, this amount right here, the, the amount sent to the recipient is misleading. The reason why it's misleading is because the recipient actually already owned this amount right here. This, is, this, is, this address down here at the bottom does not belong to the sender. Uh, it actually belongs to the recipient in a pay join. He, this is already his. This is part of this guy's wallet, right? This, this amount right here is already part of his wallet and this address is already in his wallet. So he's sending this, uh, this, the recipient is actually sending this amount to himself. But it looks like, you know, the way a pay join looks on the blockchain, it looks like it's part of the sender's money. It looks like the sender took, uh, prepared this transaction alone 
and um, and that he's sending all of this amount over to him. So once you know, though, that this amount already belonged to the sender, then in order to figure out how much the sender actually received, you have to take this amount and then subtract the amount that he already had. And as a result of that, you get, instead of receiving um, 0 0.08 Bitcoins, he actually only received 0 0.04 or almost 0 0.05. Actually, it's, I wrote down down here, but this this uh, thing he keeps on covering it up. Anyway, that's uh, that's what a page one looks like, and it's great for your privacy because it conceals the amount that you're sending to someone. Um, it, it it makes it misleading. It makes it look like um, you're sending a larger amount when you're actually sending a smaller amount. Uh, and the other thing it does is anyone who's analyzing the blockchain will now think that this address belongs to the sender when in fact it belongs to the recipient. And so this, the, the history of any coins in this transaction will have that history um, uh, now attached to a different, a different person. And anyone who's analyzing the blockchain will think this guy owns this address and the funds that were in it, or owned the funds that were in it. And that's pretty cool because um, you can like transfer your history to transfer your coins history to somebody else by doing that. And then uh, if, if ever the FBI shows up at your door and says, ah, we we know that you own this address, which had dirty coins in it, you know, you can be like, oh, well, I did a pay join. So, you know, it's, uh, it wasn't mine. It was someone else's. And then the, then the FBI will snap their fingers and go, oh, rats, and they'll leave, um, which is what we want. So I'm going to move on. I've got a few, several other things to sh share. Uh, I want to share about BISC and about Tor. Uh, specifically, or I still have those things left to do, but I know that all this coin join and pay join stuff and node stuff can be confusing. So I wanted to give an opportunity. If anyone has questions at this point, feel free to speak up and let me know your questions. There will also be time for questions at the end of this thing. Anyone have any questions so far? I actually have a, a, got... a couple. I want to distinguish between a coin join and a, and a pay join. So like what's the mm -hmm. like what's the basic difference? A coin join is where you mix, but a pay join is like joining like uh, how do I how do I want to phrase it? It's an example of more Here's so where differences. Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. The main difference is right here. A pay join is done by only two people, the payer and the recipient. A coin join is done by multiple people. In this example, there's three people who are doing the coin join together. Uh, many times you do 50, 100 Another difference is that I, I mentioned that a typical, typically in a coin join, you generate your own address and send your coins to yourself at that new address in order to make it so that people can't see where you got those coins from. But you don't have to do that. But, um, in, in a coin join, you can um, grab somebody else's address, uh, like someone who you want to pay, and pay them in a coin join. Um, so, uh, but but typically you're sending to yourself, whereas in a pay join you're always sending to a recipient. You're sending to somebody else. It's a, it's a method of payment. So two, uh, there are two differences there. Pay join is only two people. Coin join is many people. And then the second difference, coin join is typically you're sending to yourself, although it's not necessary. And pay join, you're always sending to a recipient. Got Does that it. make sense, my friend? Yeah, yeah. I, I just want to reiterate that. So uh, a pay join is is basically between the the customer and the merchant and that's that's pretty much it you can mix yeah. those however you want well a coin the join, other difference is that in a coin join a coin join doesn't hide your amount if you put one bitcoin in you're going to get one bitcoin good. out minus a fee whereas a pay join does hide the amount you're going to put in point point eight and the recipient's only going to get point five although uh you know some of that money he already owned and it just stays yeah, in the yeah. wallet yeah so, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So that's another good distinct uh, distinction between uh, the amounts are actually mm -hmm. disclosed in um, a pay join because you've just mixed up the change. Mm -hmm. I hand you a ten dollar bill, but it's actually you know a couple quarters, and I handed it to the guy behind me, and you know he put in a dollar or two. Okay. But a coin join is you can actually see the amounts, and then there's issue with with right. uh, possible toxic. In a coin join. In a coin join, you display the amounts openly, and anyone who looks at a coin join knows he put, for example, one Bitcoin in, and therefore he got uh, one Bitcoin out minus minus a, minus a fee. Whereas with a pay join, it does hide your amount by making it misleading. Uh, you think that the recipient got 0 0.08, but he actually got 0 0.05. The 0 0.03 it was already his, and it never left his wallet. 
So um, they just moved, well, I guess it, it, in a sense it left as well. It went from address to, you know, starting with 3.4 into an address starting with 3p. But, you know, that both of those are already part of his wallet. So uh, from the from his perspective, it didn't change any, it didn't change hands. Um, but it's, but that makes it misleading because anyone who's looking at the blockchain thinks he received this amount and really uh, a good chunk of that he already had. So. So I have a Thanks. question. What if the recipient doesn't have anything yet? Or if say you're creating, you're paying yourself and uh, using this pay join method, but you other want it is zero balance. Yeah, that would, it wouldn't work. Um, you could, you, the, the recipient has to already have some Bitcoins in his wallet in order to do a, um, in order to do a pay join. So that's a little Yeah, that's, that's a great question. Um, yeah, you could see there, there would be an issue with that because you would have to have somebody to uh, mix up the amount essentially. And there is no other part, there is no counterparty to mix up that amount. That's a great question. Wow. I didn't even know that. Any uh, other questions? I, I actually have one, one other follow-up question to that. If I want to go and use CoinJoin right now, um, or pay join. Um, I, I know for coin join, we've talked about it many times. Um, you know, use uh, join market, I would say is number one. Uh, Samurai Whirlpool would be number two. Um, and um, if you if you would like to as Wasabi well, wallet. Uh, yeah, Wasabi Wallet uh, as well. I put those in the chat. Um, also, the Bitcoin dash mm -hmm. only um, dot com has a privacy section, which gives a great amount of detail in that. Um, but my follow-up question is um, like what, like what programs or what applications or what wallets can I use right now with PayJoin? you know, to do a page. So this happens address. to be the last slide in my, I ha I'm skipping to the last slide in the presentation here uh, because it answers your question. Here okay. are the coin join wall, the, the, the primary coin join wallets that are available out there. I'm, I'm not even aware of other ones than these are Samurai join market and Wasabi. And all three of those also have pay join in them. Um, okay. In Samurai Wallet, it's called so it's called Stowaway, but it's the same. Um, it's it is a pay join. Uh, they just call it a different name. Whereas in Join Market and Wasabi, Join Market and Wasabi, they're, they're both of those call it pay join. Um, also, Blue Wallet and BTC Pay. Uh, there's a wallet inside BTC Pay. It's primarily merchant software, but it does have a wallet built in, and both of those wallets also support pay join. If you want to go and use it. Sorry, I jumped ahead. Thank you for answering my question. And Android. On the uh, a, the on the coin join wallets, I know that Samurai uh -huh. is um, Android only. Is that is that also with the other two? You know. So um, Wasabi is not available on phones. It is only available on desktop, and on desktop, it is at least available for um, Mac and Linux. I think it's also available for Windows, but I have not done my research on that. Um, now, Join Market is Linux only, so you can, uh, if you're going to use Join Market, it's only available for Linux devices, not a, not available on phones. You could also download uh, Join Market on uh, a Macintosh um, as well. But again, the point with Join oh, I'm Market, sorry, it, I didn't know that. I thought it, it was I thought it was Linux only. Yeah, it's also on Mac, but. Um, uh, again, the issue with Join Market, it is the best, but it's the hardest to use, in my opinion, because it's more uh, command line and terminal usage rather than a nice, pretty button uh, uh, setup like uh, Wasabi Wallet. It's, and, yeah, it's the, uh, the setup Samuel. is the hard part. It, it does have a graphical wallet inside it, a graphical user interface. That's Once you get it running, it's not that hard to use, but it's the whole getting it running thing that's really difficult. It takes like couple hours to get join market up and running you have to like download the source code and compile it yourself and it's just not pretty um yeah. there is a project called join in box uh which is part of the raspy blitz bitcoin node project and uh, that software join in box has uh, an easier way to install and run join uh, yeah join market with a graphical user interface and a graphical installation process um Hopefully that'll get more available and spread, but um, yeah. Can you, can you put the join in box any other, any other? link in? Can you put the join in box link in the uh, chat? I was searching for it a couple of days ago, 
and I couldn't word the right question or phrase in Google or in, um, oh, that's why I didn't put Raspberry Blitz next to it. It's probably going to be the first thing pops up on GitHub. There you go. Yep. There you go. Here's the link. Join a box. There you go. And Thank now you. it is just about to be in the chat. Perfect. Thank you very much. Um, you're welcome. Uh, where is this? Are we done with questions or shouts? Are there any others? Happy to answer more questions about coin join uh, and nodes. You think they can ever uh, trace the joins like 10 years in the future? I you mean, I, like a, that's a good question. Can they ever trace the, jo the joins 10 years in the future? Um, I, I wouldn't be surprised if they can trace them 10 years in the future and we need something else. But I have no a idea what, to, what 10 years in the future is going to right? I don't know. Um, I, I, it, be, it beats me. I have no uh, idea yeah. what the future holds in that, in that respect. Um, uh, it, they, uh, based on uh, the way things are now, though, don't you think that the developers kind of tend to always stay a, a step or two ahead of the, um, you know, the people that are trying? Yeah, to I think he's just saying if they figure out how to if they figure out how to trace coin joins. Then all the all the past ones are broken, right? And so then you'd think, uh, if if there's a lot of crime happening in coin joins, and now they can unravel them, um, you know, ten years from now there might be a lot of arrests happening. So yeah, who knows? Who knows what the what technology will hold in ten years, and who will be in charge, and if there will even be any interest in ten years in prosecuting? You know, I I don't I don't know if they'll be interested in doing that, and I don't know if they'll have the ability to do it. Um, ten years out is a long time for me to try to predict. Any other questions? All right, let's move on and we'll talk next about Tor. Okay, so I mentioned earlier that Tor helps protect your identity and your location. What I'm showing on screen is a browser uh, called Tor Browser and many people confuse Tor Browser with Tor. They're actually different things. and introducing my explanation of Tor with a picture of the Tor browser probably does not help to alleviate that confusion. Um, but it, uh, what, what Tor is, is a, is on the next slide. Tor is an internet privacy tool. Tor can be used to encrypt any information that you send or receive over the internet. And Tor hides your IP address. Because it hides your IP address, it also hides your identity and physical location because those are tied to your IP address. I'll get, I'll explain a little bit more about that in a second. But um, now that I've gave, given a brief overview of what Tor is, uh, I want to explain what, what, why people confuse it with the Tor browser. So this uh, Tor being a tool that you can use to encrypt any information that you send or receive over the internet. Um, since you can, since you can do that with it, it was bound to happen that somebody would make a browser that uses Tor because you, a lot of the information that you send and receive over the internet, you do in a web browser. And a lot of people do their email in their web browser, for example, and a lot of people do their, um, do their instant messaging in the web browser and, and many other the, the things you use throughout your day. Uh, so if you can encrypt all that information and use a browser that has Tor built in, um, that's, a, that's a lot better for your privacy. So that's what Tor, uh, that's what the Tor browser does is it, it builds a browser that has Tor built in so that any information you type into this browser gets encrypted and doesn't reveal your IP address to whoever you're, um, whatever service you're using. But they're different though. Tor is not the browser. Um, Tor is uh, the encryption and IP hiding thing that this particular browser uses. Um, now, Bitcoin software can also use Tor uh, and it, it tends to be used in one of three ways. Some apps have a use Tor option in settings. I know that the, one of the wallets that I use on my phone, BLW, has, uh, has a setting like that where you can say, you can click a little toggle to make it use Tor. And if, uh, in my experience, apps that work that way tend to, tend to then try to send their traffic to a separate Tor app, uh, expecting that that app will then encrypt it and send it over the Tor network instead of the regular internet. Um, but this, this only works if you have a Tor app installed on your phone or on, on your desktop or whatever device you're using such an app on. And so in my experience, if you click the use Tor button, you don't have a Tor app installed, 
it'll just say error, couldn't find anything to send my traffic to. Uh, you install Tor first, you know, and then you can use this app. Um, not all apps work like that. Some apps have their own copy of the Tor protocol built in and they don't need a separate app. Another application I use is called BISC and it's like that. Um, it has Tor built in and if, if you don't, uh, if you don't already have Tor installed or even if you do already have Tor installed, when you download BISC, which I'll go over in a minute, um, you, it's like you download a separate copy of Tor that's packaged within the app and then it'll use its own copy so it doesn't have to like rely on, on it being installed somewhere else. Um, Blockstream's Green Wallet uh, has Tor built in. I believe uh, Zeus Wallet on Android and iPhone has Tor built in so that they don't need a separate app. And that's on, th those are available on iPhone as well as, um, as, well as Android. Uh, there are also two operating systems, Tails OS and Cubes OS. And if you use either of those operating systems instead of Mac or Windows, uh, those are both Linux operating systems then they automatically encrypt and send all of your traffic over Tor, which is great because then you don't have to worry. You can install whatever apps you want on them and everything you do in there will be routed over Tor and you don't have to worry about, um, about like setting it up. It's all, it's all just covered by the operating system. So consider looking up those if you're more interested in that. Um, and we'll have time for questions in a couple more slides. Uh, but the next thing I wanna talk about though is BISC, which I just, which I just mentioned. Uh, oh, I forgot, there's one other thing I wanted to go over. Uh, this information here about your IP address. Um, so I mentioned that your IP address is tied to your identity and your physical location. And it, I didn't realize this until like three years ago that uh, I, I didn't even know what an IP address was really. So let's talk about that a little, little bit. Um, when your computer wants to go connect to another computer on the internet, uh, like Google, it wants to, your computer wants to connect to Google's computer and ask it for you know, news or search results or whatever you get on Google. Um, it effectively dials a phone number. Uh, it dials a phone number that is owned by, or it's, it's not really a phone number, but it, it dials a number called an IP address that is owned by Google's server. And that number is tied to Google's server. Only Google's server has it. And only Google's uh, server can like pick up when you quote unquote ring that, uh, that number, that IP address. So an IP address is essentially a telephone number for a computer. And IP addresses are assigned to you by an internet service provider, just like um, your telephone number is assigned to you by, by your telephone company. Uh, when, you, when you sign up for one, when you, uh, f when you buy internet from you know, Cisco or AT&T or whoever you get internet from, um, you have to give them payment information. You have to send them your credit card details or your billing address or, or other information like that. And then in return, they, for payment, they give you an IP address. And, um, and so your IP address is tied to your, um, your identity because of whoever you buy your internet from. And it's also tied to your location. Uh, like, like a zip code or like a phone number, IP addresses have an area code. And um, by looking at that area code, it's like the first four digits or something of your IP address. Uh, someone who's spying on you can actually see where you are. Roughly speaking, they can see like what city you're in. So you don't want to leak your IP address, but the problem is using standard internet, um, whenever, you, whenever your computer connects to Google and asks for search results or news or whatever, um, it, it first dials Google's phone number, uh, IP address, and tells it through its request, and then it gives it its own IP address and says, when you're ready, which is usually in a few milliseconds later, just dial me back uh, at this at this IP address, and my computer will answer and get the results or news or whatever, and then display it on the screen. So whenever you use your regular internet, you're giving you're giving information about your IP address to every server you connect to, and that means anyone who wants to can use that to look up your physical location, roughly uh, what city you're in, um, and if they need to, they can contact your your internet service provider and say, hey, who who owns this IP address? And then uh, under, like if it's the government who's asking, the, uh, the internet service provider will be bound, obligated to tell them. So that's not great for your privacy. You're giving up your identity and your physical location every time you use the regular internet. But that's where Tor comes in. If you, um, if you use Tor, then it also uh, conceals your IP address from being shared with whatever service you're accessing. And um, it, it uses random numbers instead. Um, and that's great because 
if you if they only see a random number instead of your real IP address, they don't get any information about who you are. Um, one of the downsides of Tor is that some websites will refuse you service if they see that you're using Tor. Because um, they'll say, hey, this isn't a real IP address. This is a, you know, this is a random number. And then they'll just not give you service because they want your because they want your privacy. But um, for me, when when that happens, I'm like, oh great, well I don't want your business if you if you're that insistent on getting my identity. So anyway, um, let's move on though and talk a little bit about BISC. This is the other thing that helps you hide some hide some information. Um, this is a picture of a BISC, which is a also a program that you run on your computer. And what is BISC? Well, BISC is an open source exchange app for Bitcoin. Um, instead of using Kraken, Coinbase, Gemini, or any of the other exchanges in the United States or in other countries, uh, if you download and use BISC, then you're trading uh, Bitcoin directly with other Bitcoiners. You're like, there's not there's not a company in the middle. BISC is not a company. Um, you're, you you buy and sell Bitcoins directly with other BISC users, and there are no servers involved. Uh, BISC I mentioned earlier has Tor built in. Um, part of what that means is you connect to other people without giving up, without telling them your IP address or your, um, it, or without giving them any information except what's encrypted. Um, and that's that's really good because then uh, even if even if this was a company and was trying to listen in on what you're doing, they wouldn't they wouldn't hear anything because all they get is this random encrypted data that, that they have no way to penetrate. Um, so, uh, but I mentioned BISC is not a company, it's just, it's open source software that somebody, that a team of developers write and release onto the internet and anyone can use it. Um, it's also, re it's really good for your privacy because when you trade with other Bitcoiners, you never have to give up your personal information. Typically when I buy uh, Bitcoins using BISC, I uh, use money orders to buy them, which is, a, it's kind of like a check, but a money order is, um, it's a check that's drawn on a corp, uh, company's bank, bank account. And typically how you get them is like you go to Kroger, or you go to Walmart, or even the post office has them. And that's what I usually use. Uh, and you give them cash and they give you, they take your cash and, and issue you back a check for that amount plus a fee. Um, and then now that you have that check, like let's say you give them $500 and they give you a check for $495 because they, they took the fee out of that. Um, now that you have that, you can send that to anyone and they can go to uh, anywhere that cashes checks and cash it. And that that check is drawn on the account of uh, Walmart or or the post office or whoever you got it from, and that helps ensure that that's not going to be um it's not going to bounce because a big company like that can has has plenty of money in their account. So that that's what their um, that's what a money order is. And if you use one, you never you never have to give up any personal information to anyone. You just go into a store with cash and you buy one of these things. They, they, they let you fill out who you want the recipient to be. They don't ask you for an ID or, or anything. Um, and then you send that through the mail to your counterparty. And then uh, that unlocks the Bitcoins that he put into BISC so that you can receive them. Um, so th this is really good for your privacy because as a Bitcoin buyer, you never have to give up your personal information. As a Bitcoin seller, uh, most methods, you do have to give up your personal information. Um, like if, if you're using money orders, for example, you have to give them somewhere to send the money order to. Um, and that might be a post office box, which tells them what city you're in, or it might be your physical house address, which then tells them way more information than they need to know. Um, so it's not it, like using a money order is not as good for your privacy if you're a seller, but there are options like you can sell for Amazon gift cards um, and then you're, you're not giving up your information when you do that because Amazon doesn't know what you're using that gift card for. Uh, either on the buyer's side or the seller's side. This is also non-custodial. You can use it with any Bitcoin wallet or you can use its built-in non-custodial wallet. Um, when you use BISC, you, you have you control the keys and consequently you control your coins. Um, BISC also has really fast onboarding. Unlike a regular exchange, there's no waiting period, no ID verification um, because there's no company involved to like take hold of that information. Um, you can also immediately buy as much Bitcoin as you want with it. And it resists censorship because not having a company or anyone to like send subpoenas to or anything um, or bring to court, there's nothing a government could do to shut it down. They would, the only thing they'd be able to do is, is tell everyone don't use it and then hope they, hope they listen. Um, kind of like how they tried to do, how they have tried to do with BitTorrent and LimeWire and Nas, Napster. Um, but you know these things; these things stick around. Tend to stick around because uh, 
especially when they offer really valuable services on them, like money, um, people tend to act in their own interests. Um, it's also free and open source, constantly improved by developers. And I, I love it. It's my favorite way to stack. So th that is my presentation on uh, five Bitcoin privacy tools. And here is the uh, citations. Um, the top one uh, is a website where you can learn about um, what, what, right, what it says, Bitcoin full node explained, right? And it has some uh, suggestions in there on how to get started with running your own. A couple of three coin, the three coin join wallets that I know about are Samurai Wallet, Join Market, and Wasabi. So feel free to download those and give them a try. Samurai is available on phones, at least on Android phones. Um, join Market and Wasabi are available on Linux and Mac. I think Wasabi is also available on Windows. I don't think Join Market is, but I honestly didn't do my homework on that. Pay Join Wallets, uh, the same. All of these have that, but also Blue Wallet and BTC Pay have them. I made a video on YouTube called Intro to Tor, where I go into more details about uh, how the encryption works and how it hides your IP address. And then on uh, this page right here, the BISC Wiki, you can learn more about BISC there. So I'll, I'll just copy paste that whole slide and stick it into the chat.